It is now time for oral questions. The member for Brampton East. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. My community of Brampton is one of the fastest growing communities in Canada. It's also one of the youngest cities in Canada, filled with families building for a better life for their kids. That's why we were excited at the prospect of a university campus in our community. It was a chance to create jobs and bring educational opportunity in Brampton. And I know that the people of Milton and Markham felt the same way about their plans for campuses. Why did the government break their promise to these communities? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. We promised the people of Ontario to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances. Part of that process means making tough decisions about projects across Ontario. Our, our government is being forced to clean up the irresponsible and reckless financial sure. decisions of the previous Liberal government. And we now know, thanks to the Independent Commission of Inquiry, the depths of the waste and mismanagement of the previous Liberal government. To describe the previous government's actions, the Auditor-General used words like conceal, bogus, deceptive, and unreliable. In an election year, they made empty promises to Ontarians for programs and projects they knew they could not afford, leading to a $15 billion deficit while hiding the cost from the public. Response. The Liberals have shattered the trust of Ontarians, and our focus is on restoring trust and accountability. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Back to, the uh, back to the minister, Mr. Speaker. We know that hundreds of people invested significant time and effort moving these projects forward over many years. We also know that significant investment has already been made. The town of Milton estimates they spent over a million on consulting costs alone. York University noted the donors and the York Region had already committed over $42 million, wow. and the province has already flowed $11 million. Yesterday, the minister could not or would not say how much this cancellation was costing. Can the minister tell us today how much the government has already spent on campuses they're now trying to kill off? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government was elected to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances, and that's exactly what we are doing. Due to the Independent Order. Commission of Inquiry, the depths of the waste and mismanagement of the previous Liberal government are now clear. In an election year, the Liberals made empty political promises to Ontarians for programs and projects they knew the province could not afford, hiding the costs from the public and creating the $15 billion deficit that Ontario has today. The Liberals shattered the trust of Ontarians, and our focus is on cleaning up the irresponsible and reckless Bonds. financial decisions of the previous government and restoring trust and accountability in Ontario's finances. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. We've already seen this government is not very good at planning things, Mr. Speaker. They spent $3 billion not to have a climate plan. And now it looks like they will spend millions to ensure that Brampton, Milton, and Markham don't have university campuses. They're not just wasting provincial dollars, they're taking money from universities, from communities, and from donors. When will the minister tell us? how much this government is spending to kill university campuses in Brampton, Milton, and Markham. How much is that going to cost? Minister. Minister. 
Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. But frankly, Speaker, I reject the premise of that question. We have been clear that only, only this government is committed to enhancing financial accountability and transparency. The previous Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, who supported them on 97 per cent of their votes, made empty promises in an election year for programs and projects they knew they could not afford, leading to a $15 billion deficit while hiding the cost from the public. The Liberals shattered the trust of Ontarians, and our focus is on restoring trust and accountability in Ontario's finances. Well, Thank you, Speaker. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this question is also for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. The new campuses weren't just going to provide educational opportunity, they were also going to create economic opportunity with jobs. Brampton estimated construction would add more than 1,800 jobs, and ongoing operations would add more than 1,500 jobs, according to the city. And the PC member for Markham, he said, and I'll quote, in this very room, that Markham's new campus would bring 400 jobs and half a billion dollars in economic activity. Now, to the minister, keep in mind there are students in the gallery here behind you. Why is this government opposed to creating jobs in Milton, Brampton, and Markham? Yeah. Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. We promised the people of Ontario to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances. Part of that process means making tough decisions about projects Member across for Spadina, Ontario. York, Our government is being forced to clean up the irresponsible and reckless financial decisions of the previous Liberal government. And we now know, thanks to the Independent Commission of Inquiry, the death Deceptive and unreliable. Take your, take your seat. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but you might get another chance. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the minister again. Conservative members sitting in this house. Conservative members sitting in this house told their communities that these projects would proceed. Yesterday, the new mayor of Brampton, a former MPP that most Conservatives on that side of the House happily followed for many years, he said that he had counted on the support of the Conservative member of Brampton South. Okay. During the campaign, they were clear new campuses would create jobs and opportunities in three 905 communities that get taken for granted way too often. So the question to the minister, why did you break your promise? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. And frankly, I reject that premise. Our government was elected to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances, and that is exactly what we are doing. Due to the Independent Commission of Inquiry, the depths of the waste and mismanagement of the previous Liberal government are now clear. In an election year, the Liberals made empty political promises to Ontarians for programs and projects they knew the province could not afford, hiding the costs from the public and creating the $15 billion deficit Ontario has today. The Liberals shattered the trust of Ontarians. Our focus is on cleaning up the irresponsible and reckless Response. financial decisions of the previous government and restoring trust and accountability in Ontario's Thank you. Thank you. 
final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that recording. I mean, for that answer. Uh, the government. It's not helpful. Yeah. I would ask the member to rephrase that question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll rephrase it. Chaos and resistance. The government has been smearing the plans of these communities as a liberal scheme. But these weren't liberal plans, they were community plans that have been worked on for years and years. Not only were they plans the Conservative candidates also promised to back. I'll quote the MPP from Milton. We will do everything we can to make this project a reality, wow. whether it takes $90 million or there's more we need to do." Unquote. Promise made, promise broken. broken. Why did the government lie to the people of my community? Member knows the rules. Member will withdraw. Response? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. And frankly, Speaker, I reject the premise of that question. We have been clear that only this government is committed to enhancing financial accountability and transparency. The previous Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, who supported them on 97 per cent of their votes, yeah. made empty promises in an election year for programs and projects they knew they could not afford, leading to a $15 billion deficit while hiding the costs from the public. The Liberals shattered the trust of Ontarians, and our focus is on restoring trust and accountability in Ontario's finances. Fine. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Workers in Ontario are struggling to make ends meet, as we all know, and paid leave can make a huge difference in the lives of workers who are working on or just above minimum wage. The right to a day off work because you're ill or caring for a loved one isn't a luxury, it's basic decency, it's part of being human. It's concerning that the government is taking these rights away, and we've just learned that they've also quietly released a memo that says the Ministry of Labour is going to significantly curtail proactive inspections that catch bad bosses when they break the law. Can the minister confirm that the government is not only taking away basic protections on the job, but are also planning not to enforce the few protections that remain? Minister of Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are replacing the previous disastrous uh, personal emergency leave reforms uh, that were and replacing it with a straightforward package of eight job protected days for workers, every worker in the province of Ontario. Every year. Mr. Speaker. So, I mean, you continue to demonize businesses. Uh, businesses want good employees. They want to work with their employees. Uh, there are there are job protected days for employees. The, the member, uh, you know, was is talking about um, something, uh, a, a memo from the Ministry of Labour. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the backlog that occurred in the Ministry of Labour, uh, I think you should be asking the previous members of the Liberal government where that backlog came from, because it wasn't from us, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to take this opportunity to remind all members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. The, the memo didn't come from the previous government. It came from your government. <laughs> Most employers in this province play by the rules and have good relations with their staff. We believe in good bosses. The Employment Standard Act is, is designed to catch the ones that don't, the bad bosses, the ones that none of us should support. Bad bosses who try to pay people less than minimum wage or sometimes don't pay them at all. According to the leaked memo, staff at the ministry say there's a huge backlog of complaints. And strangely, the government response is to cut down on enforcement. Minister, what is the point of having laws to protect working people on the job if the government has no intention of enforcing them? Minister. 
So, Mr. Speaker, this was a low-level internal memo from August. Mr. Speaker, there is a backlog. We should be looking sure. to the members Position of the government, government to explain the backlog. Mr. Speaker, we've been engaged in 100 days of action to turn this province around, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the latest Opposition example to order. the problem. This is the Sudbury, come to order. of fixing the problems left by the previous government at the Ministry of Labour is introducing Bill 47. Because fixing the job-killing aspects of the previous government's Bill 148, let's end the backlog into Ontario's job creation. I encourage all members of the uh, legislature to support Bill 47, because that's what the real impact to workers that really want to work in the job. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. My question is to the Honourable Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Last year, Ontario's 49 children's aid societies served more than 100,000 families across the province. Their work is vital to providing a safe and nurturing environment for children and youth to thrive. More importantly, they help bring awareness to child abuse and neglect by advocating for strong familial ties and connecting with one's community. Mr. Speaker, October is Child Abuse Prevention Month in Ontario. Would the minister please tell us what we can do to help keep Ontario's children safe? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much. I appreciate the member from Eglinton Lawrence bringing this up in question period. It's an extremely important issue, and it's one that may be uncomfortable, but we should all talk about. And I think that's the first step, communicating that it's wrong to hit sexually abuse or manipulate a child, whether it's emotionally or otherwise. I've had the opportunity to tour the province uh, with my colleague, the, the government house leader, and to visit shelters where children were staying who were also abused, as was their mother. I've also had the opportunity to go to Cornwall with um, my, my colleague, the honourable member from uh, Stormont Dundas South Glengarry, and stood with 600 people who condemned violence against children and child abuse at the Children's Treatment Centre there. We all have a duty to report it is the law. Children's aid societies are available to take your call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 Response. days a year. But, Speaker, let me be perfectly clear. As responsible adults, it's up to all of us to be the eyes and ears of vulnerable children. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, thank you for that answer. We have accomplished so much in 100 days in this government for the people. A lot of our work has come from making government more efficient. In fact, bringing the ministries that you oversee together as one was done to better serve children. Keeping children safe is everyone's responsibility, as you said, and I was pleased to hear that concerns can be reported 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You spoke yesterday about sex trafficking and its role in manipulating, coercing and abusing young girls. Can the minister tell us how pooling resources between ministries, as this government has done, has helped us to keep a watchful eye over the most vulnerable in our province? Minister. The supplementary. Um, I appreciate her bringing up sex trafficking as an issue that we should all be vigilant about. It's a growing problem in the province of Ontario, and later today I'll address the C Canadian Club uh, in Toronto about Ontario's dirty little secret, where year, girls as young as 11 years old are sold into uh, the sex trade. And that's unacceptable, and that's why my ministry is working with the Attorney General, uh, the Minister of Community and Correctional Services, the Minister of Labour, the Minister of Health, and the Minister of Education, so that we can direct direct more of our resources in this province to combating the sex trade of young girls in this province. My ministry funds programs and services focused on improving outcomes for children and youth, including initiatives to find stable homes, prevention services and supports that are youth transition into adult. But let me be perfectly clear, the sex trafficking that is happening across Ontario is a scourge on our community. It funds the guns and gangs issues that we have in this province, and we are going Spons. to make sure as a government, under the leadership of Premier forward that we stop it. Next question, the member for Windsor West. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Mary Beth is a prominent autism advocate for my community. She's a single mother raising a son, Gregory, with a developmental disability, and she is incredibly frustrated by this Conservative government's decision to scrap vital labour reforms, particularly the cut to emergency leave days. In her own words, Mary Beth writes, and I quote, Every day I see par parents try to hold down jobs and take care of their loved ones with disabilities. Every day I see elderly parents suffer, working themselves into early graves. Two sick days wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. What does the minister have to say to Mary Beth and thousands of parents like her? Minister of Labour. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I acknowledge uh, the parents uh, and the struggles that they have uh, with childcare, especially with autism. But that's why we are making changes to the uh, bill, which is Bill 47, to try and get better-paying jobs in the province of Ontario. The best thing we can do for people in the province of Ontario is create an economy where. Good jobs are produced. Businesses want to advance, advance and produce good-paying jobs, and that will help parents, Mr. Timmons, like you just mentioned, that they can find better-paying jobs in the province of Ontario, and they have the flexibility to be with their children when they're needed to be. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Labour, I actually have several parents in my riding who had to quit good-paying jobs, $25, $30 an hour jobs, because they don't have protected sick days. Parents of children with developmental disabilities face unbelievable hardships every day. They wait years for their children to get passport funding once they turn 18. They face decades-long wait lists for supportive housing. Their planned increase to Ontario Disability Support Program benefits was recently cut in half by this Conservative government. And now, parents like Mary Beth will have to forfeit their income if they have to take an emergency day off work to care for their child. How does the minister justify this outrageous disregard for working parents and caregivers? Minister. Ministry of Children's Services. Ministry of Children. Uh, for the, for the question, Services. I appreciate the uh, member opposite talking about that. Look, the Ford government completely supports people with disabilities and their families. The member opposite is aware that this government is not only uh, putting forward a legislation that is open for business, but we will follow up next month on November 8th, as the, minister, as, as the member opposite knows, in reforming our social assistance and making sure that we lift more people out of poverty and back onto the workforce where they're able. And those, those, uh, and those, those policies and those programs are being developed right now. And I can tell the member opposite that a year from today, we're going to see more people working. Those with, with children that are disabled are going to have greater supports than they've ever had. And that's because, unlike the fa past 15 years where they had a disjointed patchwork of, uh, of programs, this government is working together for the people. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the government House Leader. Yesterday, we saw a reprehensible act of political violence committed against our Minister of Labour. The constituency office of the Honourable Member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, was broken into. Windows were smashed, furniture was destroyed, and the walls were spray painted. Yesterday, this chamber was united in condemning these vile acts. Mr. Speaker, could the government House Leader explain to the Legislature the position of the government and how vital civil debate is to our democracy and tell us why these acts of political violence are unacceptable? Government House Leader. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from Mississauga Streetsville for the question. Let's be honest about what's happening here this week. On Tuesday, the Minister of Labour announced the Making Ontario Open for Business Act, a great act that our government has been campaigning on for a long, long time. And since then, since then, the members of the government had re have received uh, threatening phone calls and messages and even death threats, Mr. Speaker. One union leader, when asked what kind of action he was organizing against our government, said, stay tuned. And then a leader from 15 in Fairness refused 
to con condemn this act on the minister's constituency office during a CTV interview yesterday. Speaker. Ontario is a democracy. We should have a passionate debate on the big issues, and we respect the rights of peaceful protesters. But what happened to the Minister of Labour's constituency office is a criminal break-in, and it should not be condoned by anyone it crosses the line. Speaker, these groups want our government to back down. They want the government for the people to back down. I'm here to tell you we will not back down, and we will ensure Ontario's— Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the government house leader for his response. Civil discourse, which includes the right to peacefully protest, is a cornerstone of our democracy. However, members of this chamber continue to receive threats online, and rhetoric continues to be ratcheted up. As the minister mentioned yesterday during a CTV interview, a leader of the group, 15 and Fairness, was asked to condemn the attacks and vandalism of the constituency office of the honourable member from Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock. They refused to do so. Instead, they said they could explain it. Mr. Speaker, could the government house leader tell this chamber why this type of inflamed rhetoric is dangerous, not only to the members of this house, but an affront to our democracy? Government house leader. Thanks, Speaker, and thanks again to the honourable member for the question. We all agree that we can and should have passionate debates on big issues and that we should respect the rights of peaceful protesters. However, the criminal activity that we're witnessing not only harms the members in the legislature, but it harms the people of Ontario and harms our democracy. That's why we're demanding 15 in fairness immediately and unequivocally condemn vandalism, violence, and intimidation tactics in all of their forms. The people deserve a clear answer from 15 in fairness. Either this group supports the use of violence and intimidation, or they oppose it. Speaker, we will not back down. We're going to proceed with debating and doing everything we can to pass the Making Ontario Open for Business Act. We will not be deterred from this type of criminal activity, Mr. Speaker. We will. Stop the call. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. The opioid task force that advised the Ontario government on the, overgrowing, oh, on the growing overdose crisis has been left in limbo for the last four months. Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. David Williams, said that the task force was an important part of the province's effort to turn the tide on the opioid crisis. Can the minister confirm today if she has secretly decided to pull the plug on this expert panel? Minister of Health and Long -term Care. Thank the member very much for the question. The uh, op opioid issue is one that we take very seriously. That's why we announced the consumption and treatment services sites that are going to be um, applied for by a number of groups across the province of Ontario. The task force was one of the groups that made recommendations to our group in reaching an evidence-based decision. They provided very valuable information, and uh, there are no plans whatsoever to uh, disband them whatsoever. What we are planning to do is to continue to speak to them about what's going on, what they're hearing, what other services we need to bring forward. They're performing a very valuable service. Uh, supplementary. Back to the minister. The opioid task force has not heard from the minister's office for the last four Strip months. Tourism, come to so order. far, the Ford government has refused to declare the opioid crisis a public health emergency, paused the opening of the overdose prevention sites, wasted four months on an unnecessary review when the evidence was clear, pitted communities against each other by placing a hard cap of 21 sites. Now the minister has also prevented the opioid task force from doing Mr. their Finance, work. Come to order. Does the minister want the opioid crisis to escalate with more people dying every day? Minister. With the greatest respect, I would indicate to the member through you, Speaker, that that information that she has is not correct. In fact, we have been in touch with the opioid task force. We consulted with them. 
through our office with respect to the whole issue of the evidence-based decision-making we were doing. They were actively involved in a telephone conversation with us. They actively gave us information. They gave us their conclusions, and we took them into consideration as we were coming to our final recommendations. So the task force has been consulted with. We have listened to what they've said, and we have moved forward with it. With respect to what we're doing going forward with, with the 21 sites that groups can apply to, we we are confident that that is going to provide the assistance that we need to get people into treatment and rehabilitation when they indicate that they are ready to do that. There is more work to be done. We Response. need more detoxification beds. We need more mental health and addiction services. That is something that we are concentrating on as we are building. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Don Valley East. Here are my questions to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. On Tuesday, Mr. Speaker, the Minister announced that uh, she will be cutting $300 million from post-secondary education. And yesterday, she made it clear that OSAP would be the next item on the chopping block. History has a strange way, Mr. Speaker, of repeating itself here in this legislature. The previous Conservative government cut billions from education, resulting in low high school graduation rates and post-secondary enrollment. Order. Minister, can you please explain how your cuts will produce positive educational outcomes in the province of Ontario, and how will you avoid the mistakes of the previous Conservative government? Of training colleges and universities. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that question. And quite frankly, I reject the premise of that question. That we from? promised the people of Ontario to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances. Part of that process means making tough decisions about projects across Ontario. Our government is being forced to clean up the irresponsible and reckless financial decisions of the previous Liberal government. We now know, thanks to the Independent Commission of Inquiry, the depths and waste of mismanagement of the previous Liberal government. To describe the previous government's actions, the Auditor General used words such as conceal, bogus, deceptive, and unreliable. In an election year, they Spons. made empty promises to Ontarians for programs and projects they knew they could not afford. Supplementary. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, back to the minister. When you ask Ontarians what they value most in regards to government services, uh, they'll usually answer health care and education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, OSAP provides uh, dreams to young people who will take on the challenges Government benches come to order. organization will bring forward. Now, I know, Mr. Speaker, in the minister's uh, previous work, she advocated for a two-tier health care system. My question back to her is, are these cuts leading to a two-tier education system here in the province of Ontario? Response, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite Liberal for fluid. the question. But frankly, Speaker, I am shocked that that <laughs> member has the audacity to ask that question. <laughs> they were part of the previous Liberal government that created the $15 billion deficit that Ontario has today. They fully embraced political financial decisions that the Auditor General described as bogus, deceptive and unreliable. And I will not take lessons from members on that side of the chamber. Thank you, Speaker. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Earlier this week, you announced our government for the people would be introducing the Making Ontario Open for Business Act. During our campaign and since the June election, we heard from job creators in our communities about the detrimental impacts of Bill 148. We heard that Bill 148 was a vote-buying attempt by the Liberals right before an election. I understand that the minister has spent the last four months reviewing the job-killing Bill 148, and our bill, if passed, will remove the worst burdens on Ontario businesses while protecting the province's most vulnerable workers. Despite the NDP's fear-mongering tactics, 
and ask the member to withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Withdrawn, sir. We heard from many independent job-creating entrepreneurs who applaud the work our government's doing to provide real benefits for Ontarians with this new bill. Can the minister please elaborate on the in-depth review and consultations of Bill 148? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for the question. Uh, I'm proud to rise in the House uh, today to speak about the great work our government is undertaking. Our government is committed to serving the people of this province. Unlike the previous uh, government and unlike the opposition, our progressive conservative government listens to the people, Mr. Speaker. It's true. Despite the official opposition's anti-business rhetoric and fear-mongering tactics, our Making Ontario Open for Business Act will indeed remove the worst burdens on Ontario businesses while protecting the province's most vulnerable workers. It took the last four months. Uh, I took the last four months examining every part of the job-killing aspects of Bill 148. With every provision, I asked myself. What was the impact on Ontario's economy? Does this provide a real benefit for the people? Aunts. How do we ensure Ontario is open for business? Mr. Speaker, the reforms we are introducing are deliberate and thoughtful, unlike the last— Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for your answer. I know that our job creators and workers are glad to hear that you had these priorities in mind when you reviewed and consulted on this job-killing bill. I understand that, making, that the Making Ontario Open for Business Act, if passed, will implement a package of reforms that will help unlock the job-creating potential of Ontario's economy. I am also encouraged that this legislation, if passed, will continue to protect and preserve important provisions for current workers in our great province. The minister's practical approach to this legislation is clear. Our government is ensuring that our workers in Ontario have categorized personal leave days. Our government is ensuring minimum wage workers will receive a $14 wage in addition to continued increases starting in 2020 tied to inflation. Can the minister tell this House what other benefits this bill will deliver to the people of Ontario? Minister. Thank you again uh, to the member. Uh, for the supplementary question, as mentioned, um, the Making Ontario Open for Business Act will guarantee Ontario workers they will have a $14 minimum wage, which is one of the highest minimum wages in Canada. We will introduce a consistent, simple a system where Ontario workers will now have a straightforward package of annual leave days, three sick days, three family responsibility days, and two bereavement days, every year for every worker. As a former nurse, I understand the importance of supporting the domestic or sexual violence provisions. Our government is committed to job protection of the domestic or sexual violence leave for all Ontario workers. Businesses should have the confidence in reasonable and predictable regulations, Boss. and everyone who works should have the confidence of a good job and a safe workplace. That's what the people wanted on June 7th, and that's what we will continue to do. Next question, the member for Kiwetnong. Miigwech, Gabagat and Shenzhou, good day. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Acting Premier. Two weeks ago, uh, I rose in this House to ask a question on behalf of the family of Stephen Forbester Sr. and the people of Grassy Narrows, as uh, did the Leader of the Opposition. At that time, uh, there were uh, fitting tributes uh, to the former Chief, former Grand Chief, from both sides of this uh, place. But what, I, but what I asked went unanswered. Uh, will the acting premier uh, rise now and acknowledge uh, that Stephen Forbester Sr. lived with and died from the effects of Minamata disease? Deputy Premier. The government house leader. Government House Leader. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I acknowledge the question from the member opposite and the members who were here uh, from Grassy Narrows in question period uh, this morning. I, I would also acknowledge that our government is taking the situation in Grassy Narrows very seriously. Uh, already, our Minister for Northern Affairs, uh, Greg Rickford, and our, our Minister of Environment, Rod Phillips, uh, sitting directly behind me, have been to Grassy Narrows to meet with the Chief and, and Elders, and I know that they are going to be continuing that type of dialogue in the day 
days and months and years to come, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, what happened in Grassy Narrows is an historic a tragedy, to be quite honest, uh, in that region. And I know that our government is committed to working extremely closely with the members of Grassy Narrows and Wabesamong uh, to, to come to uh, a proper conclusion in this case and just to continue our, our committed commitment to Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Our Premier and our Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry are in Northern Ontario making more positive announcements. Thank you. Supplementary. Question to the question to the acting premier again. Uh, since, uh, as the uh, Minister of Indigenous Affairs was uh, also very quick to mention, he has direct experience with the, the former uh, Chief Forbester in Grassy Narrows. This government uh, should have no problem acknowledging that Chief Forbester was sick from mercury poisoning. Yes. Will the acting premier and the Minister of Health, on behalf of this government, commit today? to compensate everyone in the community of Grassy Narrows and the others that are affected by it for the ongoing impacts on their health and livelihoods due to the mercury poisoning. Government House Leader. Uh, thanks, Speaker, and again, uh, thanks to the member opposite for the question, and uh, welcome to the members from Grassy Narrows. I can tell you in uh, direct response to that question, it's shameful that it took the previous Liberal government as long as it did without doing anything uh, for that community. Our government has already taken immediate action to ensure that people who receive mercury disability payments are properly compensated by retroactively indexing payments to the rate of inflation, and that includes the folks in Grassy Narrows. These payments have been frozen for over 30 years, and that's unacceptable. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Minister of Northern Affairs and Indigenous Affairs, this is one small part of the work that we're doing to addressing the long-standing challenges faced by the people in Grassy Narrows and Wabasamung. Uh, our government continues to work with the First Nations community there and uh, the federal government to clean up that river system, which has caused so much heartache for the people in that community, and to take care of Response. the people who are sick in that community and help put the communities on a path towards a better future, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough, sorry, Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Speaker, I am proud to be part of a government which is committed to making Ontario open for business here, here. and creating good-paying jobs for the people of Ontario. I have heard from employers in my riding that we have a skills gap that was ignored for 15 years by the previous Liberal government, dragging down Ontario's economy. According to the Conference Board of Canada, the skills gap costs Ontario's economy up to $24.3 billion in lost wow. GDP. That lost GDP means that the skills gap cost government $3.7 billion in lost revenue. Wow. Speaker, can the minister tell us how the government's Making Ontario Open for Business Act will, if passed, reduce red tape and create better jobs for the people of Ontario? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you to the member for the question and her strong advocacy for the people of Simcoe North. Our government for the people is delivering on our promise to cut red tape and make Ontario open for business. We are committed to creating more better paying jobs and making it easier for apprentices to join the workforce. That is why our legislation, if passed, will reduce red tape for workers and employers in the skilled trade sector. Our commitment is clear. If you are prepared to do the work, then you deserve a shot at the job. And Speaker, we are hearing positive feedback across the skilled trade sector. President and CEO of Colleges Ontario, Linda Franklin, and, uh, and uh, said, apprenticeship training in this province is awash with red tape. We're pleased the government is taking serious action to streamline Response. and improve skills training. Speaker, we want all Ontarians to reach their full potential by reducing red tape in the skilled trades and create good jobs for the people of Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her hard work to make Ontario the engine of Canada's economy once again. I am proud that our government has listened to businesses that face constant roadblocks to hiring the next generation of willing workers in Ontario. Speaker, because of aging demographics, we need to do more to get young people into the trades so that there will be skilled individuals to fill the jobs of tomorrow. 
Skills Ontario estimates that 40 per cent of all jobs created in Canada over the next decade will be in the skilled trades. 21 per cent of Ontario's skilled trades workforce is expected to retire this decade, emphasizing the need for immediate action. Can the minister tell us more about how the government's plan will make Ontario open for business, reduce red tape, and create better jobs for the people of Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we are a government for the people and a government for workers in the skilled trades. We listen to employers about what steps government could take to create good paying jobs in the skilled trades. Our plan will create good jobs across Ontario. To quote Wayne Arthur, owner of Arthur Electric in Milton, we're delighted the Ontario government is making it possible for us to open our doors to more apprentices. We'll be hiring anywhere from four to six apprentices. Wow. Gerald McCann of Synergy Mechanical Limited in Etobicoke said, we're, we'll be hiring a minimum of five new, new employees. Wow. And Dennis Andritzi of Beckett Electrical said, this announcement allows us to hire anywhere from five to eight apprentices. And Jim Moyer of Waltec Electrical Services in Bolton said, we will be hiring an additional four apprentices ASAP. Speaker, we promise the people of Ontario to create Order. 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 Member for Timmins. Come to order. Start the clock. Next question, member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Kingston's Violent Crime Severity Index rose 53% in 2017 over 2016. That is the highest spike in Canada. Despite this, the Conservative government is withholding a much-needed policing effectiveness and modernization grant. Speaker, the grant was approved and was paying for front-line law enforcement teams. Speaker, why is this government cutting police officer salaries right now in Kingston? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for that question. First of all, I want to make it perfectly clear that the government continues to review its expenditures and it's looking to determine how best to allocate funds that are needed for policing. As you can appreciate, and we look in the galleries, we see all these kids that are inside the house today. Our primary concern is to ensure public safety. We made an initial investment of $25 million in guns and gangs. There's a second phase that we will be working through, and we are concerned with respect to issues with respect to policing. And we will look at the issue in Kingston as we're reviewing the other, the other, the other parts around the province. Member for we do support the police, Spons. and we are providing them with the tools they need to be able to perform their yeah, service. Yeah. Thank you. House to come to order. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question was about frontline officers in Kingston. Uh, like many police forces around the province, Kingston was using the money to fund a COAST program and give officers the resources and expertise they need to respond to emergencies where mental health is a factor. Mr. Speaker, the Ford government cut $330 million in annual mental health funding already. Now they are withholding money. The bench has come to order. Now they are withholding money that was designated for frontline mental health workers for interactions where the safety and security of people and officers was at stake. How can the government justify cutting the spending? Minister. Members take their seats. Minister. Mr. Speaker, at this time, the ministry has provided approximately $750,000 in funding to the City of Kingston and or the Kingston Police Services Board. As our government continues to review expenditures in light of the government's fiscal state, it would be inappropriate to speculate what the final amount might be. But let's be clear about this. 
We have a $358 billion debt. We have a deficit of $15 billion. Our government is responsible. It will provide the, serv the police services the, the tools and the funding they need to do their jobs. We are going to do it in a responsible way and ensure the safety of the Order. public. That is what our mandate is, and that's what we will do. Yeah. 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 Order. Restart the clock. Next question, member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. I understand there was an exciting announcement made this morning, Sarnia, by the member for Sarnia Lampton. Over the past few weeks, we have heard about the fantastic work that is being done to support the horse racing industry after it was decimated by the Liberals and, sadly, with the support of the NDP. We were all excited to learn that Kawartha Downs and Ajax Downs will be keeping their slots. We are also happy to hear that the continued support has been accepted by racetracks in Fort Erie and Dresden. It's clear that our government is making good on our commitment to support the horse racing industry. Could the minister please inform the House about this exciting announcement that was made in Sarnia this morning? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Perth Wellington. I am thrilled to share the exciting news that the member for Sarnia Lambton made this morning. Slots will be returning to Hiawatha Racetrack. Hey. Yeah. This agreement in principle helps repair the damage done by the previous Liberal government after it decimated the horse racing industry. Hiawatha had their slots taken away in 2012, and now our government is bringing them back. This agreement completes our program to provide support to the horse racing industry. The previous Liberal government laid waste to this important industry. The Premier promised that we would put an end to the Liberals' destruction and provide the industry the support it needs to grow and prosper. This is yet another promise made, promise kept. Start the clock. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. I'm so happy to hear that our government is making good on another campaign commitment. The horse racing industry is important right across Ontario, but particularly in rural Ontario. I'm proud of the action our government has taken to support the industry and support rural Ontario. After 15 years of liberal, liberal devastation to this province, horse racing can once again grow and prosper in Ontario. But Hiawatha is just the latest in a series of accomplishments for this industry. Could the minister please explain how our government has kept our promise and supported the horse racing industry throughout rural Ontario? Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Bob Bailey, the member from Sarnia Lambton, for his leadership on this file. He was instrumental in the return of slots to the Hiawatha racetrack. After the Liberals decimated the horse racing industry, rural Ontario will now benefit from that member's hard work. With the return of slots to Hiawatha, our program to support horse racing industry is now complete. All communities where slots were removed or to be removed have either been restored or returned to the racetracks wanting them, or the tracks made a business decision to accept enhanced support for their racing operations. Either way, Speaker, Premier Ford made a promise, and that promise has now been kept. Member for Niagara Centre, come to order. Stop the clock. Start the clock. The next member. Next question, member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Criminal activity in Northern Ontario is increasing, but yet the Conservative government does not seem to care. The Thunder Bay Police Service has been very proactive in reaching out to the member from Vaughan Woodbridge for support and has received silence in return. In fact, the acting Thunder Bay Police service chief made a desperate plea to the member. As Thunder Bay is feeling the effects of drugs, gangs, and firearms coming into our community. But the plea fell on deaf ears. 
Speaker, Thunder Bay desperately needs a provincial grant to assist the police in tackling guns and gangs. Will this government finally respond to Thunder Bay's request? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we've stated, public safety is our primary concern, and we're committed to examining current community funding programs and their effectiveness in reducing gun violence and gang-related activity in Ontario. What we did was we started with where the problems were greatest, which was in Toronto, with the guns and gangs grants that were provided of $25 million. Our intention was and is and continues to be to talk to the stakeholders, to talk to the various police services, and determine as a second phase what needs to be done. And we are conducting those investigations and roundtables at the present time with the hope and the anticipation to be able to deploy funding to assist all the police services where issues are uh, prominent. Bonds. We know that the issues are prominent in Thunder Bay. I'm very well aware of Thunder Bay, Ottawa, and the other jurisdictions that are feeling. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the police are facing serious challenges in Thunder Bay and all across this province. Thanks to the government's mental health funding cuts, police are even more than ever dealing with individuals with mental health crises. Yet the minister is refusing to fund the grants that support that important work. Why is the government refusing to support police in their efforts to handle the growing mental health challenges in Thunder Bay? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the member for the question, but um, I, I, I do not agree with the premise of it. We have a very good speaking relationship with all the police services in the province. And one of the things that we will continue to do is to deal with the various stakeholders to determine what the needs are in the various police services around the province. Part of the work that has been done to date is to visit various police services. And as we continue, we're determining what the needs are, because the policing needs in different parts of the province do not, are not the same as the needs necessarily in Toronto or in other places. So we continue to do the work. Our primary concern is to ensure public safety, and we're dealing with that. We're dealing with that in the places where it's most prominent, and we'll continue to do Spons. that to ensure that services, police services have the tools and can deliver the services necessary throughout the province to keep it safe. Next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, tourism accounts for over 4% of the province's gross domestic product, and it's an industry that supports over 390,000 jobs and generates over $34 billion in economic activity. Speaker, the tourism sector has seen some incredible growth in the past two years, with year-over-year -year increases in visitor spending of nearly 6%. Can the minister explain our government's plan to maximize the economic impact of the tourism industry and how it will ensure the industry continues to further grow and thrive? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. I'm happy to, and thank you to my friend and colleague, the MPP from Whitby, for this important question, because I think he underlines uh, what sometimes we forget when we talk about our tourism questions and our tourism operators, that in fact, they are an economic driver in the province of Ontario. I was very pleased to attend the uh, annual tourism summit in Windsor earlier this week, and we talked about the importance of what an economic driver does. You know, those tourist operators really are looking for certainty from the province of Ontario. That's why I was so proud to announce um, how Bill 147 is actually going to assist and make sure that tourist operators can continue to build their business, can continue to uh, provide and offer a premium tourist uh, destination when people choose Ontario as their, uh, their site Spons. of choice when they spend their tourism dollars. And I'd be pleased to talk about more about what we discussed in the supplement. Good question. Supplementary. But back to the minister, and thank you for that response. I'm very pleased to hear that we're moving quickly to get Ontario back on track, Speaker. The previous provincial framework surrounding the tourism industry fell short of transforming words 
into action. It also was unsuccessful in clearly setting out the roles and responsibilities of both the government and the industry. And it did not define, Speaker, the role of our regional tourism organizations. In the end, our tourism industry still lacks the tools, resources, and clear vision required to achieve its full potential. They know, Speaker, that there is so much potential for businesses and Ontario communities like my riding of Whitby. Can the minister elaborate on our government's clear vision to create jobs Question. and growth in our new tourism strategy? Here, here. Minister. Thank you so much. You know, during the tourism summit, and I must say uh, the, the theme of this year's summit was tourism matter, and it really drove home the importance and the value that we have in an economic sector that frankly goes north, south, east, west in the province of Ontario. No matter where we live in Ontario, we are impacted and we have the ability to benefit from tourists visiting our province and spending money in our communities and building those businesses. So part of what we did at the economic summit uh, earlier this week was announce a consultation. We want to make sure we get this right. Yep. Right from the beginning when I was meeting with the tourism stakeholders at AMO in the summer, they talked about how we needed to change the direction in the province of Ontario. To make that open for business Response. means something. To actually ensure through the changes that we are implementing with Bill 47, people will have the certainty they need to invest in the province of Ontario and make sure to Question. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. This government recently improved auto insurance rate increases as high as 11.6 percent. This is the fourth consecutive quarter the government has allowed auto insurance rates to increase. Why is the minister allowing insurance companies? to jack up their rates when Ontarians already pay the highest auto insurance rates in the country. Minister Finance. Okay. Please tell me you're ready, Farm. <laughs> well, let me remind the newer member of the deal that the NDP struck with the Liberal Party. This is exactly the disaster that became the industry uh, insurance industry prices of today. A deal was cut by the Liberals to have the NDP support their budget if they made a stretch goal promise that nobody on either of these sides ever intended on uh, uh, reaching fruition. So, look. We, we hear you loud and clear, but you really should be talking to your leadership in the party yeah, yeah. to understand that you are part of the problem here, certainly have never been part of the solution. Members take their seats. Once again, I'll remind all members, please make your comments through the chair. Supplementary. Thank, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the uh, Minister of Condescension and Obvious Arrogance. People in my... <laughs> I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Dad. I withdraw. Place your question. People in my community of Humber River, Black Creek, are paying more for their auto insurance than other Ontarians just because of where they live. This is just unfair. There is no good reason. Good drivers in the Jane and Finch neighbourhood should pay double what other drivers in the GTA pay. That is why the NDP have put forward a bill that will end postal code discrimination in auto insurance once and for all. Will the minister stand up for drivers in my community who are being penalized just because of where they live and support our bill to end postal code discrimination in auto insurance? Minister Finance. Well, thank you uh, very much. The Premier has made it very clear, Speaker, that our government is committed to ensuring fairness in rate setting, ending discriminatory practices, and working towards a system that puts drivers first. Now, our member from Milton, Tarn Gill, has worked on this file and presented a private member's bill. 
His provo proposed initiative is a great way to combat rate discrimination in our auto insurance system. He has done this right. He consulted with shareholders right across the province and wrote a great bill. Unlike the NDP member from Brampton East, who wants the GTA to be considered a single geographic area and have all of his own Bonds. members' rates skyrocket. That concludes the time we have for question period. Member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome Rebecca Grundy to the legislature today and just remind all members of the photo that will take place on the staircase for Rethink Breast Cancer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Point of order, the member for Nickel Bell. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I would like to join to uh, thank all of the uh, people who uh, support Rethink Breast Cancer and he came to Queen's Park. Thank you for coming and remind every MPP that they are offering us a lunch in room 228. Uh, please come and listen to what they have to say. Thank you. Minister of Community Safety. Correctional services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to correct something. I believe I used the number of 354 billion. It's 338 billion. Thank you. The member for uh, Etobicoke Centre. Welcome a school from my riding that's coming to visit us here at Queen's Park. Wallaceworth Junior Middle School will be here with us today, so welcome to Queen's Park. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to introduce the grade 12 class from the Royal Buff Christian School from Norwich in my riding of Oxford to the legislature today. And welcome. We're very happy to, uh, to see you here. Leader. Speaker, our uh, Director of Legislative Affairs in the Premier's office, Cody Welton, will be delivering a very educational and informative speech in the Ontario Room in the McDonald Block, 3 o'clock this afternoon, to Queen's University students. I know it's going to be outstanding. Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Education. Thank you very much. I would just like to congratulate Bob Menka on his recent engagement. Thank you very much. <laughs> To remind the members, we do have introduction of visitors at the start of question period as well. And that's an opportunity to do these opening pleasantries as well. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 34, an act to repeal the Green Energy Act 2009 and to amend the Electricity Act 1998, the Environmental Protection Act, the Planning Act, and various other statutes. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bell.
Members, please take your seats. Would the members please take their seats? I would ask for the attention of the House, please. <laughs> On October the 15th, 2018, Mr. Rickford moved second reading of Bill 34. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Fideli. Mr. Fideli. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Smartow. Mrs. Smartow. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Cove. Mr. Cove. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Ms. Sirma. Ms. Sirma. Mr. Parsa. Mr. Parsa. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Antifilopoulos. Mr. Antifilopoulos. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Kanjin. Ms. Kanjin. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mademoiselle Simard. Mademoiselle Simard. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Kawartha. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanigasala. Mr. Tanigasala. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Baber. Mr. Baber. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the clerk. Mr. Tabas. Mr. Tabas. Madame Jelina. Madame Jelina. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Ker Kernaghan. Mr. Kernaghan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. The ayes are 60, the nays are 25. Wow. The ayes being 60 and the nays being 25, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, designated to the Prigidal. The order of the House dated October 24, 2018. The bill stands referred to the Standing Committee on Social Policy. We have a deferred vote on Government Notice of Motion No. 14 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 32, an act to amend the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998. Call in the members. This is another five-minute bell. Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 60, the nays are 25. I declare the motion carried. Yay! House stands in recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>